Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and I am going to be covering material on Chapter 12, Analyzing International Opportunities. And this is a chapter, usually in this class, that I will go over very quickly, because typically in our class we will be kind of in the the final stages of doing this project and that project was the export marketing plan in all of the steps in chapter 12 will have been executed or most of them or at least to some degree and but we're not doing that type of, of project we're going to be doing something slightly different because of the situation that we have. So I do want to look at the syllabus in terms of where we're going. I do like to show the syllabus that way we can gain our bearing in terms of where we are and where we're going. So this is April 2nd. And today we will cover chapter 12 on Tuesday. It will be chapter 13. I'm looking to have a quiz on uh, Tuesday. And it would be on both chapters 12 and 13, a relatively short quiz. And that is just to keep you engaged and it will give you some kind of orient more orientation to the testing material before... Uh, the exam uh, that we have on the 23rd. On Tuesday, I will also uh, cover Chapter 13. Chapter 13 deals with market entry strategies. So it is talking about how to get your products from point A to point B. And while that may be easy in theory, in practice, it is wrought with a lot of challenges and pitfalls that you have to that you have to manage. I do want to say something about our third exam. We had an exam on the 31st, um, which was Tuesday, and it was the exam on financial, international finance, and international monetary policy. And I posted some comments about the exam and also what I saw to be some irregularities uh, in the taking of that exam. But this is a very, very different time that we're in. You know, we're all dispersed and it is very easy to fall out of a routine in terms of your, your uh, schooling and also for the professors. We have to stay on point. But I believe that there were many problems uh, with the exam. And as I stated in my post, I take responsibility for having administered the exam and perhaps a flaw or glitch being uh, made in one of the settings. And those things do happen. Mistakes do happen. But unfortunately, um, people can sometimes take advantage of mistakes that you make, you know, which is also um, unfortunate, but it does happen. But what you don't want to do when you make a mistake is you want you own up to it but you don't defend why you're making the mistake and what is worse than making a mistake is passing that mistake along for others to continue this cycle because it's we we can't afford to uh, continue down that path and mistakes if you make a mistake, it's a good thing, actually. Mistakes, especially if they're small, and if you learn your lessons early on, your mistakes are very small throughout your life. And mistakes are a way of 
looking at yourself and making some improvements to say, okay, I've made this mistake. I'm going to move on and I'm going to be a better person for it. That being said, with what I found in the third exam, the irregularities that I'm talking about, and they're very, um, I won't say easy, but we have a lot of tools on this end where we can see things, we can see activities. And I also want to say to all of you, and you've been told this before, everything that you do has a footprint. There's a copy of it somewhere. There's a log file where we can see things. And so you want to be cognizant that you're not violating not only ethics, but violating the law. Because these infractions can be very serious and they can send you down that rabbit hole and thinking that, okay, this is the way I get things done. And it is certainly not the way you get things done. So uh, you want to make sure that you always keep your integrity. And I said this before, prior to the, the exam, you always want to make sure that you keep your integrity because that's all you have. Once, once your integrity is gone, then people begin to look at you with less credibility and less respect. And that is just that is just what reality is. And so I just want to reemphasize that. And I will be making some announcements about what I have found on the third exam. And I will let you know I have been conferring with um, my superiors, including uh, my chair and uh, the dean. Uh, which we have to always discuss these issues when they come about and the types of remedies that and I'm just looking at the uh, message uh, from the Dean and she's giving you know the guidelines uh, but this is very serious folks this is not uh, we're not playing games and this is your future and we're all here be because we want to we want to help you to succeed, but you have to uh, help us to help you succeed. And that's why we're here. So I will be making announcements in terms of how we're going to rectify this because we have to repair the damage. We've got to repair the damage. And yeah, I can be draconian and I can crack the whip and I will crack, crack the whip in another way. But uh, again, this is very serious. So going forward, you want to make sure you take a self-assessment and and look at uh, how you want to finish this course and reapply yourself and um, make your preparations, do your ratings, look at the videos and uh, finish strong because that is exactly what we need to do in the times uh, that we have today. Uh, we're in some very serious times, folks. People are dying. People are out of work. People are desperate, and it's just not—it's um, just not a time for um, any any um, letdowns in terms of morale and uh, also our, our our discipline. So that's all I'll say about that. So what I will do now is I will make way for chapter 12 by saying some things. Uh, before I get to chapter 12, there are some things I want to say about 11. You're not going to be tested on 11, but the, but the subject is very interesting and probably useful for you. Going forth, you're going to be going into the workforce in a year or less. Some of you may be graduating in May, and uh, I hope your position has not been affected by the current uh, crisis that we have in the country. Uh, we indeed uh, are going to see some effects uh, of this of this um, virus outbreak. But I want to say a few things about organizations. Organizations have changed over time, and you look at us now, and what are we doing? We're holding a class in a virtual setting. We're all in our various places. And you're looking at this video on a computer or on a cell phone. 
And many organizations are operating in this way. You have a lot of some of my friends, they work from home. Because uh, one, one of the things that is happening is a lot of companies are figuring out that we need to save overhead costs. We need to save money, right? Because of revenue issues and, and just um, the cost of business. So a lot of companies are getting rid of their office space. And they are building... Uh, spaces that are more open. And I can just kind of give you an example of how office spaces are evolving. So these are the open office spaces that you have now, which contrast a lot with the cubicles that I experienced years ago when I was in corporate America in Chicago. I work for a computer company and we had our cubicles. And the cubicles gave us a sense of privacy because we were on phone calls and we were doing our work and we didn't want to be bothered, frankly. But these office spaces are going um, the way of the dinosaur. They're becoming extinct and you have this more open office space. The other thing companies are doing is they don't have any desk at all. So they have people who are out in the field who are doing different things. And if you need desk space, you either have a standing desk or you can reserve desk space. You can say, OK, I want to reserve this space here in the office. You reserve it. You use it. You're done with it in an hour and then you go on about your business. And, and so you have these changes in terms of the structure of the workspace and also org behavior in terms of how people are approaching work now. You're working from home. And even in addition to that, when, when you go to the office, people are dressing casual. They're bringing their pets to work. You have yoga sessions, you have a masseuse on site, you have um, nap areas, you have all of these things that are changing because what is the trend? To make work more like home. And that way you'll be happy to come to work, you'll be more productive, and then you'll also work longer hours. The last thing I wanna say about this is a lot of you bristle at the fact that you have to wear suits twice a week when you go to uh, the forum series meetings. And you figure it's not something college students normally do. But you have a stage because when you walk across campus, people look at you with admiration because they see that you have a purpose. And it's probably the same when you see the nursing students wearing their their outfits, or you see the pharmacy students wearing their coats. There's a, a certain look of professionalism that we're trying to bring to our students. And it is a great platform that we have, and it is something that we, we are known for. Across campus, if anyone sees you walking across campus, and let's say there's a visitor and someone asks a student, who are they? Who are the, these students? They will say, that is SBI. That is the School of Business and Industry, and they're having their weekly forum series. They have CEOs, and now this person who is not even in SBI is marketing your program because of the professional image that you have presented to the, to the public. So that's why we take effort and I was hired by Dean Mobley and I was able to see her at work. I was able to understand her vision. I understood why she had this structure, why she had certain um, aspects of professional development. Now, bear in mind, now some of you will say, oh, professional development is redundant. We do the same things. 
And granted, some things need to change. But for us, and you going into the environment of work, of work environment, it's much easier for you to tone down than to tone up. Imagine this. You already know how to wear a suit, a tie, shine your shoes. You know how to greet. You know how to conduct yourselves in the presence of CEOs. And you know how to do that. You have your 30 second elevator speech or all the other things that you learn. You go to an environment where they say, no, we're casual. We're, we are casual. And you're like, really? You mean to tell me I can wear my whatever? I can wear my ripped jeans? And they might say, oh, well, maybe not that far. You can't go that far. But, you know, business casual, polo shirts, you know, um, no ties, that sort of thing. In some places, you know, you can wear jeans, but they have to be presentable. In some places, they'll allow you to wear anything that you want. I, I was um, working for a computer company. I had an account. It was an advertising company. And people in that firm were wearing everything. And the, the color, their hair, purple hair, and all kinds of just their attire was different. But that was the nature of that industry. So that it's um, it's a, an evolution. We, we are evolving uh, but in terms of SBI philosophy, we feel that it's best to give you that professionalism so that when you go out, not to mention applying for a job, but then you go out and you can easily adjust in different environments. Whereas some of your FAMU, fellow FAMU Rattlers are not able to do that because they've never put on a suit and they've never been taught these things. So these are some of the things we talk about organizations, the idea of when you talk about working in global environments, working in teams, they have also in this chapter, they talk about work teams. So in some situations, you're going to be working with people in different parts of the world. You will have never met them. Uh, only through through this um, vehicle or through Zoom or Skype or one of these other uh, platforms. Uh, and this is essentially the wave of, uh, of the future or the future is now. So, yeah, that's um, what I wanted to give you on that in terms of this international strategy and organization. And you'll probably take more of that when you take your management classes and org behavior and all of those um, classes that you're required to take. I'm going to go into chapter 12 here and I'm kind of looking at my script. We're almost 20 minutes in and so feel free to take a break at, at any time. Uh, hit the pause and take a coffee break or get a drink of water or a snack, uh, that's fine. So analyzing international opportunities. And what does that mean? It suggests that we are obviously looking to go overseas. In the early part of the class, we actually reviewed a case that was about cheeseless Cheetos in China. Right. We all remember that case and we re remember what PepsiCo did when they came in and they had to do, obviously, some research. They established a joint venture. They found out the highest per capita income. They, they, they found the region with the highest per capita income, which means that there's probably more disposable income. They looked at the local culture. They found out that dairy products were not the mainstay of the diet. They tested some flavors. They came up with two flavors. They ended up making product adaptations, not only through the ingredients, but also through the packaging. And so this was kind of a textbook case of, of analyzing international opportunities and then market entry strategy, 
which is actually the next chapter. But in that short article, you had all of these lessons that were being uh, that were being uh, executed right before your eyes. There was also a video on McDonald's in India. It was in one of the review videos where you had to watch this uh, multinational corporation that we all know go into India. And what's so strange about that? Well, India is a country that is predominantly Hindu and they don't consume beef. They don't consume animal um, products from the cow or residuals. Now, they do drink milk, but in terms of using parts of the cow, the hide of the cow, the meat of the cow, that is prohibited. And you can be arrested for slaughtering a cow in India. But McDonald's said, oh, we will not be deterred. We are going into India and we're going to see what types of opportunities we have. Now, they already knew that there is over a billion people. So that's a lot of revenue that we can potentially make. If you get even a small percentage of that market, you're going to certainly uh, be doing very well. And McDonald's is in uh, about 150 countries. I believe there are 150 countries now. Maybe not, maybe not quite 150, but they're, they're, they're close to that. And so they've been able to do the analysis, look at all of these different variables, and then make their, uh, make their mark. We've also seen trends happen in the opposite direction. Uh, we have seen trends, for example, this hookah craze. People go to hookah bars and they smoke on these pipes. And they may not have known where that came from, but it's kind of a Middle Eastern tradition where you have people. When I was in Egypt and I saw people sucking on these water pipes, well, they call them uh, water pipes there. And it's have a, a mixture of water and uh, there's steam that comes out and it's flavored. And it, I guess, is a very uh, pleasant uh, experience. But I will say, I went to a, a shop once and I have a picture that I'm showing here. We were in a, a shop and a souvenir shop in Cairo, Egypt. And my room, roommate had... Uh, I had two I had two roommates. So one roommate came to both myself, Jean, the person that wrote the article that we reviewed, and said, Hey, there's a shop, a souvenir shop. They have some nice souvenirs. And so he takes us over there and we're looking around and I'm looking for things for my family. In the meantime, it's uh, around lunch. It's the lunch hour. And so the the uh, shopkeeper, the owner of the shop, had some food and he offered us lunch and you know we sat down and he had uh, drinks for us. But then he had this uh, hookah pipe or water pipe and he was uh, he lit it up, but then he was putting something else in there and it was basically hashish. So it was kind of kind of like uh, marijuana. And he was partaking in it, and my roommate was partaking in it, and he was, you know, you can tell it had an effect on him. And so obviously, these hookah pipes can be used for other things, but it is a very big thing now. It's a social, uh, it's basically a social outing where you sit around and you talk about different things, and then you puff, and puff on this hookah pipe, and you, um, and you enjoy the evening. And it, it's um, apparently very had been very popular here. So let's go on. So it's a lot of a lot of talk about Starbucks in textbooks because it, it is a very interesting company. Uh, there is actually a this thrust of 
um, activity from Starbucks to move into China. Again, we see the cheeseless Cheetos in India and all these populous places, countries are trying to get in. So you have this idea of China going into, uh, of Starbucks going into China. And they have opened up a Starbucks that is, I believe, one of the largest, if not the largest in the world. And it has a bar area, a coffee bar area that is 88 feet in length. I think it's 88, 86, 88 feet in length. It is a huge place and it is, uh, it is very attractive. And so imagine you take a tea drinking culture and you are introducing coffee and it has begun to uh, take off. And how do you enter a tea drinking country if you're a, a, a coffee company? You know, that is that is a very interesting problem. Now, I must say uh, Starbucks has begun to pull back in terms of their stores and even in the US they have they have actually uh, closed stores uh, over 100 stores but Starbucks is is one of those places that if you see a Starbucks open up a shop a coffee shop then you probably want to open up a shop nearby because Starbucks has done the research they have analyzed the opportunities and now it's time for you to capitalize off of that. So here's the screening process. You're looking for markets. And in our class, we had uh, a number of countries and you were to do this screening and you were to choose a product and that product was going to be adapted to suit that market. Okay, we had to scrap that because of what has happened. But these are the steps that you would execute. And it may be similar to the steps that China, that uh, what happened in Cheeseless Cheetos in China. These may be similar to the steps that PepsiCo took when they went into China with Cheeseless Cheetos. So first, you identify the basic appeal. And what does it mean when you identify basic appeal? You have to first look at whether there's a market. Okay, that's very straightforward. Because at the end of the day, you want to do what? You want to make a profit. Let's be real. You're not doing this for your health. You want to make a profit. So you look at demand. You look at the population. That is one variable, which is why there's so much activity in China and India. But just because you have a large population does not speak to demand because you have to look at demographics. You have to look at age, gender, ethnicity, income class, education, all of these things to determine if you have a demographic that will have uh, a particular demand for your product. And 
of course, if you're going into that country, you have to determine what resources are available to help that product get to that particular segment. So do they have a functional distribution channel in place? Do they have a protected or do they have uh, censored media? Does my ad copy have to go through the government before it's approved? How free is the press? Uh, you look at all of these things and certainly there are very uh, comprehensive studies that have been done. And I'll just show you this real quick. Uh, I wanted to show you this later, but I'll show it to you now. So this is the done by The Economist, which is a British business magazine. And they have these studies uh, that are done. And so this is what which country is best to do business in. So it gives you all of this data about countries and ease of doing business and rankings. And so you look at this and th this may be a ground for you trying to determine whether a country is suitable or not. So they have these uh, rankings and there are a lot of a lot of documents such as if you go to the institutional investor, if you go to the um, Standard & Poor's, I believe, um, what is what is the other um, magazine? Uh, World Trade had a country analysis every year. And so they give the ranking country rankings in terms of the ease of doing business. But you want to determine if there are enough resources available for you to be successful, because otherwise it's just really uh, a waste of time. Then you go into assessing the national business environment. So in the beginning of the or in the midway of the course, we started doing the the export marketing plan and I had had a plan for you to assess the national business environment through looking at what I call preliminary analysis, looking at uncontrollables, which what I call uncontrollables and what some textbooks will call uncontrollables. So that is the political legal environment, the economic financial, the social cultural, the technological, the human resource environment, competitive environment, geographic environment, all of these different environments will make a difference in how your product can be accepted or whether there are barriers that you have to face. Maybe there are cultural barriers like we saw in China. Maybe there are legal barriers that do not allow you to use certain ingredients in your products. Maybe there are political uh, barriers such as having to go through the bureaucracy and maybe the turnaround time for you to get things done is just elongated and, and, and so it's just difficult. Or there may be economic and financial forces that you have to deal with in terms of economic trends, whether it be positive growth or whether it be fluctuation. And then you look at the whole idea of currencies and we just spent a lot of time on that. You look at uh, the country's credit history. Countries have a credit history. So you look at all of these different factors and including some of the the uh, analysis that I just showed you of country, uh, country analysis. You can you can actually buy these reports and, and they're very expensive. But the project that you were doing originally would have resulted in a plan that companies will pay for. They will pay for that. And they will pay five figures easily for that type of research uh, for you to identify what markets are suitable uh, in that country. So these are, are some of the uh, variables that you have to that you have to analyze prior to going over. If you don't do this, you run a great risk 
of wasting money and time. Believe it or not, a lot of companies have done that. They said, oh, we're going to cut corners. We don't have time. And, you know, R&D is expensive. You look at PepsiCo. They tested 800 flavors. That was very expensive. Took a lot of time. Some, some companies either don't have the time or the money. And so, or the will to do it. And so they say, oh, we're just going to go over and present this product. It works here, is popular here, so it should be popular in country X. And that is uh, very naive, to say the least. Looking at some of the other measurements, and we talk about measure, market, uh, or site. So market, you're talking about what you have defined whether it's demographics, psychographics, behavioral segmentation, or whatever you have decided, looking at that. And then where do you get your data to determine that market? Well, you do what they did in Cheez-Its, Cheetos. They did focus groups. You can do surveys. You can do other types of analysis, consumer panels, interviews. But that data has to be readily available. Otherwise, it's hard for you to make a conclusion. Then you look at, as I said before, you look at economic trends. You look at um, growth. You look at market demand. You look at um, disposable income. You look at consumer habits. You look at income elasticity. You look at the classes of what people buy, whether it's necessities, luxury products or whether it's the uh, you know the goods that people uh, really don't need but want so you have a lot of you have a lot of different uh, variations then you look at countries that have growth patterns such as the emerging markets the BRIC countries Brazil Russia India and China along with those in Southeast Asia. And quite frankly, many African countries are on a growth pattern. You take a country like Rwanda, you look at Ghana. Uh, in fact, in one of our journal articles, there was a, um, there was this assessment on how fast Ghana is growing because of the investment they're receiving from uh, foreign countries, most notably China. And so there's this growth pattern across um, the continent. Many African countries are benefiting. Uh, Botswana is also another one of those countries that is looked upon very highly in terms of their infrastructure. South Africa is the richest, but it's also uh, a little unstable socially and uh, economically. The, the distribution of income is is very uh, desperate. It's it's um, you have uh, inequitable distribution of income, and while the blacks in South Africa now run the government, the economic balance of power is still the same. You know, primarily, you have a maybe a slightly bigger middle class, but in terms of the lower class, you still have the majority uh, will be the the um, the blacks in South Africa. Some potential market indicators, I'll run through some of these market size, of course. And you think the bigger the population, the bigger the, mar the, bigger the market size. And that's generally going to be true. But you also want to look at uh, how population is distributed. Is it mostly in urban areas? Is it in the rural areas? Do you have migrational shifts, people coming from the countryside into the city? And so you have these migrational patterns, which uh, is very interesting on a number of different levels. It does create more population, but then with it also comes other social issues that you have to deal with. A lot of companies sometimes like to get that migrant labor because it's cheaper than those who are educated in the city. But that's a whole different dynamic. A lot of companies are are looking at that and as as an attractive um, 
characteristic. Market growth rate, market intensity, consumption capacity, commercial infrastructure, economic freedom, market receptivity, country risk. These are all the things that you would find in those studies. And they will give you an analysis. Say you have a country like Eswatini, which used to be called Swaziland. It's in southern part of Africa. Uh, and I actually went there a couple of years ago. But say that you're in Eswatini and or let's say you want to do business there. And prior to going there, you want to do some analysis. So you get a country study and you look at all of these, all of this data that you see on the right hand uh, of the screen will be part of that country study. And so you'll be able to act on that data and be able to make a determination as to whether Eswatini is a good place or whether it needs to have a little bit uh, more, uh, a stronger infrastructure in order for you to move forward. So here are some of the other issues. We talk about labor, labor issues, labor laws, regulations, wage levels, working environments, training needs, local infrastructure. These are all very big issues and they're not to be underestimated. These issues are not to be underestimated. When you talk about training needs and you go to a country where maybe the training is not as high. So now you have to really make some investments. And we're may, may be assuming that they can speak English. So if that is not the case, then you have to, maybe there, there's more training that comes in with, with that position, uh, if that is part of the function that they'll be, uh, that they'll be fulfilling. So now you select market or site. So you've done your analysis, you've done your research, and you say, okay, I'm going to choose this site. What am I up against? And you've done the uncontrollables. The competitive environment is very important to know what kind of environment that you're in. And you'll get that through the reports as well. But typically, you would take a field trip. You would go over there and you would get not only a lay of the land and sit down and speak to business professionals or maybe somebody in the ministry, but you just, you want to get a lay of the land in terms of the environment, the feel of people, how they interact, what makes them excited, what they, what the trends are, what they aspire to be how they move throughout the day. All of these are things that you can't get looking in a, in a book or a country study. These are just things you can't get. I mean, I've traveled to enough countries to have uh, been able to appreciate that there are, there are things that you just can't get uh, by reading a book. And there are things you, that you can't even describe. You just have to be there and, and there's a feeling and field trips are often necessary if you're a consulting company and this company has hired you and they say, well, we're looking to go into Malaysia or Bolivia or going into Burkina Faso or uh, Costa Rica. We want to go in. We, we're, we're looking at these places and they hire you and you go over to these countries and then you're going to try to do the research to provide them with a report so they can determine whether this is a site that's worth uh, that's worth entering or not. So some of the competitor analysis, number of competitors in each market, market share, of course, these are things that you learned in marketing or may have had in marketing. The uh, regulations, you have different rules. You, you, you follow the national rules, but there are often different rules for foreign companies when you go in. So you have to be cognizant of that. 
uh, potential threat from substitute products. What is a substitute product? Well, it is what it suggests. It is a product that can be substituted for the product that you're selling. Not necessarily a counterfeit product, but just something that can substitute for yours. Let's say you have some some type of a uh, of a beverage, and you go into this market. You have a special beverage, but there's this guy that sells coconut water on the stand every day. It's been there for 20 years. Well, that is a substitute product. It's a substitute for yours. They can either buy from him. They can buy from you. They can drink from the tap. There are a lot of options. So you got to look at the substitution effect. But you also have to look look at the the uh, regulatory environment because somebody can steal your your invention. And there's lots of videos, uh, lots of funny stories about how brazen uh, people can be in terms of stealing intellectual property of of, of companies. So how do you collect this data, this research, to make this decision? Well, you have two ways. And you all have been at, at FAMU for years, a few years. Some of you are about to graduate, and you've done a lot of projects. And most of the research that you have done, and probably all of it, Maybe not all of it. Maybe you've done some primary research. But most of the research you've done has been secondary. Process of obtaining information that already exists within the company or can be contained, obtained from outside sources. Like many sites online have these materials, books, magazines, or their digital equivalent, country studies, uh, these these uh, guides on um, country risk that you can find these are all available some of them free frankly not all of them are free some of them are very pricey you have to pay for this this research and you have companies like Nielsen that conducts market research and you can have a, a subscription and that information is updated and so that you can stay current. Um, but for this, when you talk about secondary market research, this is relatively inexpensive because this information that has already been uh, collected. The good thing about it is that, yeah, it's inexpensive, but what is the drawback of using secondary market research? One of the drawbacks is that this research may not completely fit your particular problem that you're trying to address. It's not tailor-made because you're getting it from other sources, maybe from other company sources. But if you do primary research that's suited specifically for you. So what are some main sources? Some of these uh, I have already mentioned, international organizations. We talk about the World Bank, the United Nations, government agencies, the Department of Commerce. You have in industry and trade associations. So depending on your industry, you would have uh, specific materials. I was looking at a site that was basically... Uh, it's basically about frozen food. And so you had an entire site with all these resources about the frozen food market. And it was very extensive. And I was looking at it because we did a case in my other class about a best frozen foods company where this company was trying to go into Germany with frozen foods. And they received a lot of, uh, there were a lot of barriers that they had to overcome. And so I came across this this uh, uh, industry industry uh, website. 
you have trade associations, service organizations, and obviously you have the internet. So again, some of the problems, availability of data, uh, specifically in countries that do not have a strong uh, structure in terms of information. I will say this, tell you this story, and I told it to my other class that I was in Ghana conducting research for my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation. And I was there to conduct interviews because I, I needed some primary research to go along with my questionnaires. My response rates were low, so I needed to bolster this, this, uh, this research. So I go to the, I was at a conference, a technology conference, and I go to the desk and I ask for a phone book. And that phone book was five years old. And I asked if they had something more current and they said that is the most current that we have and this is kind of the when you go to these countries that's kind of the the trend where you you don't have information as readily available as you find here which every interval of time you have new information coming out and it's very reliable but Sometimes when you go to these countries, they don't have the same type of uh, research, uh, the uh, research environment. You also have to look at compar uh, comparability of data. There are lots of differences in terms of how data uh, may be uh, collected, um, how data are measured. Uh, it's uh, when you start talking about certain methods, uh, survey methods, uh, survey methods vary from country to country. And when you start talking about focus groups, are you going to be in a focus group where people are afraid to, to be critical? Because in a focus group, you want people to be critical. Now, again, that's primary because you're getting it from the source, but the point is data can be measured perceived differently or if somebody um, you know, presents some a report to you you may read it thinking that it means one thing when it actually means something else so you always have to look at how uh, information is conveyed what are some of the other ways of getting data you have your primary we already know about interviews, we know about focus groups, consumer panels, and of course online questionnaires are also in that group. But there are some other ways. There are trade shows. When I worked at the Canadian Consulate during my doctoral uh, studies, I was at the Canadian Consulate and I was in the international marketing, what was it? the, the um, International Marketing of Technology Group. And so what we did is we would go to trade shows. They used to have one in Atlanta that came to Atlanta called Comdex. And so it was a trade show. You had all these computer vendors and they were just showing their new products, the latest products, and it was very fascinating. So we would have our booth up, the Canadian Consulate, was based in Atlanta. And basically, we would have information for companies who are coming by to do business in Canada. And uh, it was very interesting because sometimes when it was slow, I would walk around and I would get to see the new gadgets and see what the um, CEOs of certain companies were, were announcing. It was kind of this big show where you have, you might have somebody like Bill Gates. Uh, in fact, Bill Gates did come to one of the Comdex meetings because he spoke at the Atlanta University Center in Woodruff Library in a, in a, in a kind of uh, packed house. And I was able to ask him a question on the uh, technology development in Africa. And he um, was very intrigued at the question. So much so that after the, the, the talk was over, a lot of Microsoft 
employees were running after me trying to get my information, trying to get my name in because they thought if Bill Gates asked about who was that guy that asked, then okay, they're they're being they're an opportunist because I got his I got his name and I got his number, and they're thinking okay that might make them look um, like they're on top of things, but nothing ever came of that, and I ended up. Um, Continuing on my path to FAMU, although I thought for a minute that I would be at Microsoft or Silicon Valley, uh, but that didn't happen. Um, also, environmental scanning, as I close, we're almost at an hour, but what is environmental scanning? <clears throat> Pardon me. Well, it is not just... I'm going to scan the environment like observation. We know that in, in research, you have the observational method where you go and you do an, kind of an observation of the, the environment that you're in. Well, this is essentially a, a way to ensure that you have a process of, of ensuring that your information is going to be current. And the way you do that is to build a, a research cycle where real-time data are coming in. And then you're able to adjust and you're able to, to make adaptations. You're able to switch. You're able to contract your product line, expand your product line. You're able to do things uh, in a, in a time-sensitive manner. So it says here, page 310, the environmental scanning process entails obtaining both factual and subjective information on business environments in which a company is operating or considering entering. The continuous monitoring of events in other locations keeps managers aware of business, of potential business opportunities and threats. Environmental scanning contributes to making well-informed decisions and to the development of effective strategies. It also helps companies develop contingency plans for a particularly volatile environment. And there you have it. You know, it is a very uh, intensive uh, process and when you talk about being on top of things. And one other thing that I will say is when you're looking at other markets, and it is also true in real estate that location is key. Location, location, location. That's what they say when you're you, you, you're trying to decide where to put a store, that you have certain locations that are optimal. And by the way, you can buy these plans from the city, if they have the data, on traffic flows. Where traffic flows, what are the peak times of the day, to determine the optimal corner on which to build your store. What is foot traffic? Because in some places where the traffic flows, you don't have pedestrian traffic and the cars can't really get off. And if you have a store in a place where the cars can't turn off, then that's a disaster because you're missing all of that traffic that's passing by. And the other thing, the last thing, is that when you determine the, the location, you want to make sure that you're thinking in terms of an anchor market, anchor. You want to anchor that location, and then you want to that location to be the anchor for expansion into other areas. Maybe other areas within that country, maybe other areas within that region where you expand into other countries. And so you have the anchor market and you choose one that's vibrant, you choose one that has resources, and then you go from there. That's why in most places you have companies that go into major urban areas because that's where the resources are. And then they're able to set up shop, they're able to test products there, and then they're able to move out from that location. So that will do it for chapter 12. I hope that that was helpful. Uh, we will have a quiz on Tuesday after 
chapter 13. So it'll be on chapters 12 and 13. Trying to make sure that we're leading up to the uh, exam and that you have enough uh, information and you have enough practice as well. So that will do it. And uh, make sure that you check in today so that I know that uh, you were able to view the video and again on Tuesday we will have chapter 13. It is possible that I may have a guest speaker coming to our class. I have a Terry Waters who was my student some years ago who worked for uh, some years in Belgium and Belgium is the um, the home of Anheuser-Busch. It was formerly an American company, but now it's, Belgian, uh, it's a Belgian company. But Terry Waters worked in Belgium for some years, and he told me via LinkedIn that he absolutely loved it and it was a great experience. And he told me that he would be interested in speaking to our class. And so I'm working on that, and I'm looking for some time in which that can happen. So you'll get more updates uh, from me on that. So again, be safe out there. Practice social distancing and all the other precautions that you need to take, washing your hands, and we're all doing that and being very mindful of our environments now. And we're going to get through the semester and everybody is going to uh, be stronger for it. Okay, have a good weekend and I'll be talking to you on Tuesday. Take care.